That's a big one. That's very big. There it is. The iron fist and the velvet glove. <laughs> Ed Campbell. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. How are you doing? Golden boy. Dragon boy. That's me. The filth. <laughs> He's back. Keep him coming. The bitch is back. You okay? Yes, thank you. How are you? Very well. Great to have you uh, with us. Great to be here. Ava Santina, Capital J journalist. Hi, I'm not meant to be here. <laughs> You're actually not. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> so you, you could thank us for having you here. Thank you for having me. Yes. Do, okay, so Explain. I came in this morning. Mm -hmm. I got to the desk and everyone was looking at me like, what the fuck are you doing here? And I was like, I think I'm still employed, am I not? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were like, you're not meant to be here. And I was like, oh yeah, I booked a day off. And then they spent the next half an hour convincing me to go home. <laughs> but I didn't. We failed. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we're also joined by um, Josh Kaplan, my dear, my dear friend, very good friend, and also the digital editor of the Jewish Chronicle. Hello there, head of digital or whatever, it's fine. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I got off to a terrible start. Um, Josh, how are you? Good, thank you. How does this week find you? Um, yeah, it finds me. It finds me. That's as, that's as uh, enthusiastic as I'd like to be about okay. this week. Very good. Um, what else have we been up to, guys? Ed, Ava, busy? You've been off, actually. So, yeah, I've been off, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, Ed, what have you been up to? Watching <laughs> Dominic Cummings and Keir Starmer yesterday. Is it a big, oh, a big old day of watching, watching men speak. Which is good. Good. Yeah. How did you find it? We were going to get um, Ed to cosplay as Dominic Cummings today, and then we didn't. We didn't. Yeah, you see that we were. Did, I, did I miss that? Well, well, I when was that discussed? It, it, Ava said we should do that. That would be funny, and I said, "Yeah, we should." And then no more action was taken. White shirt, black tie, and then a balding, a bald cap. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you do the voice? I don't think I can actually. I can't when, really think what you said. When we did, like. when we did our um, Keir Starmer and Asawa role play, you, <laughs> yeah. you, did, you didn't do an accent. No, because I think that actually cheapens it. Yeah, yeah. I think the power of your acting, you should, you should just be like, no, Dominic Cummings is Scottish for the sake of this, <laughs> this reenactment, and it wouldn't. Fuck pig, <laughs> <laughs> cunt, moron. Wasn't didn't um, the Scottish guy, David Tennant, didn't he do Hamlet the, in a Scottish accent? The Scottish, the Scottish guy. He does a lot of Scottish roles. <laughs> the only Scottish man. <laughs> the Scot. There was some story about him recently where I think it was in his Good Omens TV program. And some like script editor or somebody was like, and if David can do a Scottish accent for this pit, as I'm asking whether he could or not. <laughs> There's a very good English accent there. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Good actor, David Tennant. Yeah. One of yours. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I actually, remember, yeah. remember he from the, the bit, SMP. didn't he? Yeah, he did. Invent, uh, famously. It's not a stage name. <laughs> what? Tennant's. Tennant's. No, it's not, but it's not a family thing. No, no, no. no, no David no, Tennant no. is a stage name. His real name is like David Smith. Hey. By Toot Tennant, as is. Why do people do stage names? Because, say his name's David Smith, he had to join Equity, the Actors Union, and there was already someone called David Smith. So he just adopted a stage name. It's to do with, like, is that generally what happens? I think so. Interesting. Really? Yeah. Or it's like boring, like you don't want to be yeah. just another David you sex, Smith. Sex yourself up a little bit. Yeah. In your stage name. Mm -hmm. okay. Does it do it for you? No. What? Tennant. No, no, David Tennant doesn't. It's not sexy. But it's more distinctive. Like you've got a very distinctive surname. Yes, I do. Some say distinctive, some say stupid. <laughs> <laughs> made up. I've got the worst surname. Sorry, what? You think my surname's made up? No, we'll I was, come, we'll come I was to you. Doing, and yeah. come to I, you don't, I don't. I was doing a bit. Are you doing a bit? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he means that. You what? should be Digmore for your shirt of small holding. <laughs> you know? Digging dig dig for scoops also. Yeah, there is that. Dig yeah. and Doug, are the, they are the same verb, Yeah, but they? Doug Moore is not, you know, semantically correct, is it? Neither is that sentence, so. Mm. Woo! Why do you think it's silly? It just, it just doesn't sound like a real name, does it? <laughs> Doug Moore, like, what, what is it, man? Is it, is it Australian? What, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, there is actually another Doug Moore, mm -hmm. uh, who's a journalist. He's like an Ipswich Town football journalist. Oh, a successful journalist then, on like... 100%, on the yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> we occasionally just... You, DM, Doug Moore on Doug Moore. <laughs> yeah, we just DM each other little things like, good name. There's someone, there's an Ed Campbell who works for the BBC, and one of my friends got an email from that guy, like a really formal like work email being like, hi, Ollie, can you... This is no pleasantries whatsoever. <laughs> and she was like, why is Ed being so rude to me? <laughs> I mean, she thought I was being an absolute knob to her. But, but it wasn't you. It wasn't me. Mm. Other one. You have a stage name. I don't have a stage well, name. Well, you do. You I do. don't you have, have a stage name. You have a nom de plume. Nom I de have, I have. Nom de 
<laughs> I have a first name uh-huh. that was my Twitter handle long before I ventured into, I guess this is journalism. And wow. um, well, I was insulting myself. You're not still, in, the, still in holiday mode. No, I was insulting myself. Your not the employer, <laughs> myself. <laughs> what I'm protecting myself from is I say things like, oh, I'm a journalist. And then some guy called Barry on Twitter later will be like, you slag, you're not a journalist. And mm. I'll be like, huh. So, so anyway. you're agreeing with him? <laughs> About the slag bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to tell a story then. And I thought, yeah. better not. Um, yeah, okay. Oh, no. So, no, Ava Santina is my, my name. Mm. Evans is my last name. It's Italian, all right? What would everyone, the Evans bit isn't. What would everyone's name be if you adopted the Ava convention of naming, you, naming yourself? Is Santini your middle name? No. Ava Santini is one word. It's one name. Mary Bernadette is my... Bernadette wow. is my, oh, Catholic, so it's, so my it's like Catholic a, name, actually. It's my confirmation name. Sick. So is your yeah. name Ava hyphen Santina? Yeah. Right. Okay. That, is, that is mind expanding. Well, you know. So you're, like, so you're like Madonna? Huh? You're like Madonna? <laughs> Madonna has one name. She has two names. No, but it's, but it's one first name. Oh. Well... Yeah, I guess it's just a du- I don't know. But, you it's know, like a Mary Ellen, right? Or like a how. yeah, Mary Kay. But I it's guess. not as crap as Mary Ellen. <laughs> Sorry, so it's like Ellen. We've been missing out on the opportunity this whole time to call you Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> Bernadette's my confirmation. Yeah, name, yeah, yeah. But it is now my legal name. You know, really? Well, yeah, that's what you do. You really wow. commit to it. Mary Bernadette is such a different person to Eva Santina. She's such a she's such a crap saint. She's like the saint of friendship or something. Oh, like this that. this guy this guy sat right next to me here. Mm-hmm. Nate Sean. Pardon? Middle names. Yeah, Nathan and Sean. Oh, right. Sorry. I completely <laughs> misheard what you said. <laughs> okay. Nathan and Sean. Nathan and Sean. Who, who are they to you? Uh, Nathan is just like a nice name that my, my parents liked. And Sean, actually, is a good story. Uh, my mum's friend's son was a missionary in Africa. I don't know why your hands, heads in your hands. Yeah. It's a good story. <laughs> um, and her son was called Sean, and he got machete to death in Africa around the time that I was born. And so my mum was like, do you want to be Sean? I was like, I don't know, I'm a baby. I had no taste in it. <laughs> Who? So now I have um, what happened? A, t- yeah. a touch of Irish in, in my name. Lovely, the, lovely story, isn't the it? The way that you put your hand over your face, I thought it was going to be like, that's the man my mum had an affair with or something <laughs> like that. Like, <laughs> you know, it was the machete thing was mm. a bit of a climb down from that. Are Sorry, we doing a massive <laughs> like GDPR on ourselves? Are we doxing ourselves by doing our middle names? Will this, all, will this make the cut? I can read out my national insurance number if that would make I do that. <laughs> I've been doing that every episode. <laughs> <laughs> and he just cuts it. <laughs> <laughs> just dropping it, whispering my it into the mic. Name, first name of my pet, <laughs> all, all the hits. And they just cut it every time. I have a friend who tattooed her national insurance number on herself which is a fucking mental thing to do when you grow Why up you and you're done? like, you get a bit of context to that and you're like, what the fuck have you just done? Quite convenient if you're changing jobs a lot though, isn't it? You can just be like, <laughs> yeah, but for what reason? Where did she get it done? Oh, when we were in uh, Iron Apple. No, sorry, I meant what body part. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like here. <laughs> um, really questionable. Well, at least, you know, it's a variation on a theme, isn't it? It's not like, I don't know your grandfather's name in his handwriting or like a feather or something, you know? Or like, you know, uh, like some yes. hieroglyphics or... Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Um, but it was, you know, she, she did it like on the strip in Iron Apple. Should we start talking about politics <laughs> at some point? Should we talk about the COVID inquiry? Yes. Obviously, there was a general uh, um, uh, feeling in Number 10 that the way in which the Prime Minister responded constantly to the media was uh, extremely bad. There were specific concerns about his relationship with the Barclays and the Telegraph, and there were specific concerns and also suspicions of possible corruption in terms of his relationship with Osborne and funneling money to the Evening Standard. Unfortunately, a large part of how the system works is that ministers parade up Downing Street, the cameras click, people act like Cabinet is actually deciding things, but everyone behind the number 10 door actually near power knows that that's very rarely actually what's going on. Mr Hancock is unfit for this job. The incompetence, the constant lies, the obsession with the media bullshit over doing his job. Still no fucking serious testing in care homes. <laughs> his uselessness is still killing God knows how many. I also had complaints uh, from officials to me, qu- qu- entirely rightly. The Cabinet Secretary said to me himself, 
the British system does not work if ministers lie at the cabinet table, and, and you have to convey this to the to the PM. We knew he was, in any objective sense, unfit to be prime minister. We also knew that he knew too, since he told us. Is that your blog? It is. In your statement, did you say that he couldn't chair meetings, stick to a plan, or build a high performance team? For sure. You helped to put him there, did you not? Sure. You called ministers useless fuckpigs, morons, cunts. Do you think you contributed to a lack of effectiveness on the part of ministers? No, I think I was reflecting a widespread view. He has a good turn of phrase, Mr Johnson. Would you agree that there was in the government of which you played a major part an orgy of narcissism? Certainly there was. Edward Campbell, yesterday Hello. we were watching the goings-on uh, in Paddington as, first of all, Boris Johnson's spin doctor, Lee Kane, and then the motherfucker to end all motherfuckers, <laughs> Dominic Cummings, provided oral testimony to the COVID <laughs> inquiry. <laughs> Come on. We should have him back. <laughs> I think that's fine. I think what you said was fine. <laughs> what should I have said? Verbal? Uh, it is oral. It is. It is oral. I don't think anyone. Was... I, they laughed in the gallery. Did you not hear them? I did. <laughs> Sacked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> End the record. <laughs> would you like to tell us more about Dominic Cummings' oral? You can go. <laughs> uh, so Dom Cum said uh, in the um, testimony. Well, he said a lot of things. I guess the the top line that you mentioned already was he called everyone useless fuck pigs. <laughs> yeah. Um, morons and cunts. Mm -hmm. Uh, which obviously is funny. Beyond that, I don't think that's the most interesting thing that came out of the meeting. No, I think Dominic Cummings actually made this point himself, in that everyone's saying, oh, he called them useless fuckpigs, when really it's, they were useless fuckpigs. <laughs> <laughs> As in, there was like absolute chaos at the heart of government. They weren't prepared for a pandemic at any level. And but just before we get into that, yeah, really important, I think, philosophical point, uh, definition of terms... What is a fuck pig? We have to ask Cameron. <laughs> well, I think that, that is your fuck pig, right? Mm. As, that, as that, used in that context. That's a classic. That's like the most obvious. Black Mirror, term. David Cameron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah alleged, yeah. allegedly. Um, the thing is, watching Black Mirror, and then I was like, that's good. Well, no, no, I, no, no Cummings, the, I mean, not Cameron. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Did that inspire the thing? Uh, possibly. Or possibly Cummings saw the fuck pig situation occurring <laughs> and thought that is. Know that to be honest. With you. Is there a BDSM application that I'm not familiar that with pigs? No, no. That like you know how you have like a pay pig. Yes, I don't. But <laughs> <laughs> I get offered all the time. I used to have a very close friend that used to make a lot of money. Do you? Do you? Do you really? Because I feel bad taking their money, but I mean, I you can't. You can't have any sort of feelings in that game. I was thinking I might take it and then give it to a food bank. That's nice. I like. I like tax. You're, you're like a mini state at that point. Yeah. I literally got asked. The horny tax. Isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah, horny tax. Oh yeah, I'm good with it. Oh, this one doesn't say specifically pay pig. It just says, "Can you accept my okay?" Pay pig is the one where you you get off on the idea of giving oh, someone okay. tons of money. Yeah, that's yeah, you yeah. are the pay pig. Do you scenario. accept pay pigs? Should I reply? Yes. <laughs> well, do you accept pay pigs? Well, it's a legitimate question. I just send a link to the Trussell Trust <laughs> and see what happens. What the? What is that? That's not nice. Whatever. No, it's not very nice at all, that, is it? That is a man's bulge. I don't think it is. No, yeah, I think 100% so. One hundred percent, it is. Is it? That's, that's, is that not I mean, her finger in there? Too delicate on it. That's some cupping, um, and I think there there should be balls somewhere in there. Maybe they've tucked them quite well, haven't mm. they? <laughs> back to back to Dom Cum. Okay, we haven't established what a fuck pig is, but nonetheless, some on Urban Dictionary it suggested it it was a woman who you would sleep with but not marry. That's what it said. Aww. That sounds but, like, Oh my God. That don't, sounds like root one misogyny to me, Ed Campbell. Absolutely, it does. <laughs> and I, 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 I don't think that's specifically what he was meaning. What if, you, <laughs> that's what, what if you don't want to marry them? Does that still make you a fuck pick? Or can you negate being the fuck pick <laughs> if you don't want to marry them? I don't think the fuck pick gets to decide whether or not they are yeah. the fuck pick. I think it's like... You are something a applied. I think someone decides you are a fuck pig. Right. And, and mm. then behaves accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a title you can claim for yourself. No, I don't think you want to. Well. Maybe you can reclaim into. it. <laughs> Shall we reclaim it? 
<laughs> anyway, the point you're making, Ed, yeah. is that it was fairly problematic that the most allegedly most senior people in the country were useless fuck pigs. Yes. Yeah. I don't think anyone should aspire to be a useless fuck pig, especially in government. You want to be a useful one. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You want to be <laughs> You want to be left on the shelf, no one's to marry you. Yeah. But you're extremely good at your job. <laughs> <laughs> you have thoroughly prepared for the pandemic and maybe someone will then marry you. On that point though, that was that there was a job listing, I think, that I saw that was like absolutely no work life balance. It as part of the evidence. It was like do not apply if you want work life balance. Was that his was that oh, his yeah. job his, for the weirdos weird like, Yeah. So I think you could you could say that was an advert for a useful fuck pig. <laughs> so, I think, yeah. <laughs> so I think you're gonna get called a fuck pig either way, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I kind of read it well, if you want to be slightly charitable, you could see it as like his version of like cockwomble, just two funny sounding words. I, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly where I think it. It's just a just a sort yeah. of expression of, you know, expressive expressive sort of expletive, you know, you're a fuck pig. It doesn't yeah. really mean anything. Like a Malcolm Tuckerism. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, because Malcolm Tucker was actually funny. Very funny. Fuck pig's yeah. funny. I mean, Are you that kidding? Is... No, sorry. That's a, that's sorry. So funny. I know you're on holiday yesterday. I don't know if you watched all four hours of it. He is incredibly funny. Like, I, did, I, did. I cannot so tell you funny. how much of a dick rider for Dominic Cummings I am. <laughs> I fucking love the man. I've been. I've. Whoa. <laughs> um, I've been enjoying Dominic Cummings ever since. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, ever since he. Uh, did the politi all politics is wrestling theory? Mm. You know he got on board with that and kayfabe. Ever since then, I've been a domhead. He gets it, you know. You know kayfabe. Remind me what kayfabe is. Well, it's like um, like in WWE. You know how it's a performance, but it looks completely real and yeah, everyone buys into the performance. Completely real, yeah. Yeah, but you no, know, look, you know. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to sell the falls and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah but they're actually all it's all fake <laughs> and it's all stunts and whatever. Mm. Yeah, that's what politics is. Yeah. Actually, a really good tweet earlier about how to spot an SW1 NPC. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which was uh, one of his best. He's a, he's a king. I, do, I, I don't, I don't, I don't actually say that. I don't mean that at all. <laughs> 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 I retract that. Do you not like him? I think he's a fanny. Like, I think, like, oh, I, wow. I, sorry, I fucking love it when he calls people fanny. But I think it's like, it's so, I thought yesterday was like, when he was pointing out all. Oh, he was trying to make the case yesterday that he was the one person at the heart of Downing Street that could have, he was controlling the levers. He was put like, everything was going wrong and only me, Dominic Cummings, who was also there and present when things were going to <laughs> shit, I was trying to stop them from going to shit instead of admitting that maybe he was contributing to the shit. He was also there. He was part of the top team that was running the country during the pandemic and the pandemic was a fucking disaster. And he's there trying to present, oh no, actually... It was all the useless fuckpicks. Me, not a fuckpick. <laughs> you know, you Useful. Know, you know what <laughs> Useful point guy. that pro is, is proven by is when he um, he said that the cabinet office was no longer allowed to give documents straight to Boris Johnson. Everything had to go through him or his friend Tom Tom Riddle or whatever his name is. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> whatever. Um, Shinner. You used the Shinner. nicknames for really funny. They had, they had to go through one of them two. And then like later in it, he's like, anyway, and like the, the wrong data kept turning up at Boris Johnson's door. And I just, right, so, so you're actually in charge now yep. of delivering the data and it's still wrong. There's yep. a, a really interesting um, aspect of that, which I think we'll get into momentarily about, he said some really interesting stuff about the cabinet office and its role in government and where power actually is uh, in Britain. But it does, it does bear, uh, it needs mentioning that both him and Lee Kane, the spin doctor, Kane all. <laughs> said in different ways that Boris Johnson was essentially useless. Um, I think the way Kane put it, which was slightly more diplomatic, was that he had the wrong skill set for the crisis or something like that. But, is that a surprise to anyone though? No, 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 absolutely not. Absolutely not. It was um, the wrong crisis for this prime minister's skill set. Yeah, right. So um, that's your view. Uh, plenty of people outside of the, sort of the right wing in this country who haven't drunk the Kool-Aid have been saying for a very long time that Boris Johnson neither has the sort of personal skill set, like the wrong skill set for this crisis, I would say the wrong skill set for any crisis, uh, complete lack of detail, complete lack of morals. And yet both Lee Kane, Dominic Cummings, and many, many others were more than happy to install him in Downing Street mm. to mastermind, uh, well, not just mastermind, because obviously Boris Johnson, it has to be said, he is an effective political campaigner, obviously, to put him in government, to make him prime minister, and to let him lead the country. And then, you know, crisis happened, 
and to go, whoa, 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 whoa. This is, this is, this was a terrible idea. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> I didn't know he could do this. <laughs> but he doesn't even admit to that until, the, until what, he was sacked. I mean, you look back at the Rose Garden, right? They're still playing kayfabe there, okay? Because mm. Johnson is defending Dominic Cur Cummings' eyesight. Dominic Cummings is still defending Boris Johnson. And now that everything's hit the fan, they've completely shattered the illusion that there was, you know, any kind of, um, or the performance, that there was any kind of um, joined up thinking. Mm -hmm. And actually, if he, I mean, he probably fucking loved it in there. Dominic Cummings, right? And it's only because he's been kicked out. Now he wants to make sure that he's assaulted the earth behind him. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a degree of honesty, isn't there? Um, I, I probably, you if you look at it, and, and you know, to be clear, absolutely none of us have a direct line that, like to any of these people. I, don't, I do not know Dominic Cummings. Well, I've actually sent him many messages that he has not replied to. Yeah, I've, I've emailed him a fair few times being like, well, we'd love to interview you, Dom, daddy. I, I emailed him today saying, kayfabe, Dom, kayfabe. <laughs> That's it. That's um, I imagine he probably saw in Boris Johnson a useful idiot that he would be able to basically get into Downing Street via and then implement the civil service reform um, the procurement reform, which he's obsessed with, and various other, you know, um, changes to government, and Boris Johnson could be the vehicle for him uh, achieving that. The, the the part I was going to talk about the cabinet office and one of the things he wants to change, and that both he and Kane mentioned in their testimony was how powerful the cabinet office has become. Uh, I think Cummings actually used the phrase "deep state" to, to, to refer to the cabinet to, use, to refer to the cabinet office. Um, which is obviously a, an arm of the civil service that has no political accountability, um, suffers very little scrutiny of any form, and yet, according to these people who are absolutely at the heart of government, is absolutely fundamental to the way in which the country operates. And that, for me, again, in much the same way you were saying about the fuck pig stuff, the fuck pig <laughs> stuff is funny, and mm. we have obviously, we've joked about it for about 10 minutes, mm -hmm. but there was, there was some revelations in that testimony that were incredibly revealing and relevant i think there was other things they could have talked about as well that they didn't get to but that for me was one of the uh one of the standout standout bits of testimony yeah i actually was working as a civil servant briefly in 2021 one of your many jobs one of my many jobs were um, you a fuck pig oh well, this is, you know hard you to say well, yeah would have loved to have been a, a useful <laughs> fuck pig um <laughs> but i was i was working in in the home office and i was only there for for a couple months but the amount of like stupid shit that happened on like a daily basis like okay classic example when everybody moved to working from home they sent out tens of thousands of desk chairs to civil servants across the country and then i asked someone when i left i was like what do you want me to do with the desk chair like you said i have to give it back and they're like yeah you should give it back because you know the uh finances are based on you giving it back but we actually have nowhere to put any of these chairs so um, <laughs> we don't have anywhere to put ten thousand chairs so i guess keep it i was like all right okay i mean i still have the chairs in my living room um or not <laughs> <laughs> it's actually in the um, home office right now yeah another, another classic example <laughs> Tuella Bradman, dawn raiding you <laughs> <laughs> your ergonomic backrest Fuck, i really hope not um i don't have a chair i've never had a chair um <laughs> <laughs> Another classic example, they gave everybody in the department uh, work phones uh, that couldn't use WhatsApp, so everyone just used their personal phones, which is absolutely classic. And um, Why didn't they have WhatsApp on it? Was that to discourage security you? Thing. For, yeah, right. So as in they were like, WhatsApp is not secure enough to go on these government phones because you will do <laughs> sensitive government business on the phones. Uh, so I guess just use your personal. What's more secure? iMessage, but you could just hack into iCloud. Well, I mean, yeah, or no, emails, you're supposed to do everything through the through the emails on your phone, which are like encrypted or something. Oh, um, right. Yeah, and then also in, in something that would have definitely pissed off Dominic Cummings, they sent me a monitor and they sent out tens of thousands of these monitors that actually only had EU plugs. Uh, so, <laughs> oh that's great so that's I couldn't so use good it. Um, and then also so when I was working there they did the Dom Cummings cuts and they're like we have to get rid of you know 30% of the, the home office comms team or whatever and so what they did is they just relabeled everybody's job and just moved them around a bit so like I think no one actually got made redundant they just <laughs> he, talk, he talked about that yeah. in the testimony yeah, 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 yeah. he was I can't remember who he was talking about it may have been Helen McNamara <clears throat> it may have been Helen McNamara yeah it was Who? where he was like um, if if someone does not get her out of this fucking building, <laughs> I will handcuff her myself. Yada yada yada. Yeah. And I, he he didn't like her. For, I, I don't know the reason why. Uh, but maybe he's, because he's, she's a woman. He said they got on well on a personal level. To be fair to Dominic Cummings. 
that's so he, he doesn't do like now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being Thanks, fair. King. I'm being fair to Dominic. I mean, he did say some pretty. Actually, do you know what? I don't think it's fair to say he didn't like her because she was a woman, because it seems like he didn't like anyone in there, right? Yeah. He thought everyone was. That's the point he made as well. He yeah. was like, "It's not. Misog- I'm not being misogynist. They're all cunts." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then he did say there was a line about her throwing her stiletto or whatever. Yeah. Can we stand yeah. up that she wears stilettos? I've got no idea. What sensible woman is wearing a stiletto to work these days? Yeah, I mean, she obviously isn't wearing stilettos to work, is she? I mean, and that would be insane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be objectively insane. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's totally her right. If she wants to wear stilettos <laughs> to work, she can. I don't think she is. Is it, is it misogynistic to... a uh, int- Interesting point of conversation, actually. Would like to know your views. Is it misogynistic to call someone a cunt? And is it misogynistic to say that she could throw a stiletto at him? I just think stiletto is a very specific... Gender, doesn't because, it? Yes, you wouldn't say that about you, would you? And, you you know, <laughs> if he said something like, oh, he, he brought his butt plug in again, you know, you'd be like, that's a, that's a really rude thing to say, wouldn't you? Mm. Because that's... <laughs> I think if you said stiletto again. about... <laughs> Ollie, oh, we've no. told you before, you cannot do this, this is your workplace. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I'm in charge. I'll do what I want. <laughs> it's like sitting on the desk. <laughs> Suction cup. You sitting comfortably? <laughs> Always. Ollie's just not getting up from his chair anytime soon. <laughs> Bit of that. Is it misogynistic to call someone a cunt? Because <clears throat> for me, it's a term of endearment. I know that's not how he meant it, but... In America, it really is. Yeah, they really, really They take really it. hate yeah. it. Yeah. I don't think Bit I've ever UK. called a woman a cunt. I think Why I'm did really you cool. look at me there? Well, I'm going to start <laughs> no, now. Like, that was the first time no, no, no. <laughs> Give it a go. You might like it. Cunts. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I didn't actually like that. I don't want to do that. Um, the way you kind of whispered cancelled. that. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like you don't want to be like aggressively Fucking calling someone up. a cunt. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is it a set up? <laughs> but I wouldn't think so twice. So clip that, Sean, right now. Clip that. Clip <laughs> all channels. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I would call, I would, I pretty much exclusively call men cunts. Both when they are being cunts and when they're not being cunts. So you're actually, you're not an equal opportunities cunt caller. No, I'm actually pretty, um, pretty misandrous when it comes to my cunt usage. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> um. Anyway, back to the COVID inquiry. No, no, sorry. Yeah, we can go back to COVID. I just got a Ed had an expression on his face that looked a bit white knighty, and I wanted to know if he was going to do. No, like, no, I was, I was trying to, is, is misogyny. No, I was trying to uh, avoid long, I go with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was looking up. <laughs> why were you trying? To like... Because I was like, from a really like practical point of view, I was like, I don't have anything to add. Ah. Um, so if all the mates I go with me, he's going to bring the conversation to me, and that will mm. slow this down. So I wanted to, to the COVID inquiry. <laughs> to the COVID inquiry. Um, was there a quote from War and Peace? Oh, in his meetings. Yeah, no. there are a few good quotes. Yeah, it was like I, I don't know the quote off by heart unless you do. But it was like, but it was like no one expected the war that was inevitable. Yeah, or something yeah, like yeah. that. There was, there was, <laughs> <laughs> was just great. as Tolstoy wrote. Yeah. And then there was one from I've got it here. Nothing was ready for the war which everybody expected. War and Peace. That's good stuff. Then, definitely on digital project management, we've got nothing to learn from the private sector. <laughs> <laughs> that's from, no, read there who that's from. That's really funny. Jeremy Hayward, cabinet secretary. <laughs> He's fucking funny. I'm sorry. Then, <laughs> yeah, he is. Then, fascinating that the same problems recur time after time in almost every program and that the management of the program, whether it happens to be government or industry, continues to avoid reality. So many programs fail because everybody doesn't know what it is they are supposed to do. George Muller, leader of the Apollo program. And then, statement of evidence to COVID inquiry, Dominic Cummings, 11th <laughs> of October, 2023. Good stuff. He really reminds me of the boys who were on our English literature course when I was at uni. Yeah. Um, it's a really deep quote on the cover of that dissertation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, like, definitely not read the book. <laughs> but will spend a lot of time at a party by the kitchen sink telling you why you should read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. War and Peace, you know, one of the one of the greatest uh, books of our time. You you probably can't read, so I'll I'll let you know what's inside it. Uh, <laughs> On the road, another huge book for those guys. Huge book for them, you know. Yeah. And good for, you know, good ha- for them. Has anyone read War and Peace? No. I actually have read War and Peace, but I had to. Have you? Have I ha- you no, but I had to ha- for my degree. Have you though? I had. To, you know what? You Are you my, doing a kitchen sink thing? You can read my thing. fucking essay on it. All right. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Call me a cunt. <laughs> no, I'd like to keep working here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the road is not as definitely not as big as 
War and Peace. Say. War and Peace. Is no, like we're not. Size doesn't matter. Like a, That's what we're a, saying. It's it's you know it's the <laughs> it's a status signifier. It's yeah. It's it's, it's just one for the lit boys. They they love it. Mm. They dream of discovering themselves in Southern California. The they never have. The kind of guys who wear nothing but like old suits and bowling shoes at university. And you're like, why do you dress like that, man? Buy some jeans, brother. <laughs> do you know I bought a Hemingway the other day, and I I was <laughs> I was one? reading it, and I was thinking to myself. Um, oh. Sorry, no, go on. I was going to say the audacity of Ed to be like, buy some jeans, brother, when he sat here in fucking cargo trousers is absolutely outrageous. That's a normal thing to wear. No, You're based... wearing fucking denim on your top, not bosom. That's <laughs> 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 the opposite. the opposite. Not denim on the top. I'm also not wearing like, an, like a 300-year-old suit. Like Denim on top, baby. You know like the worst sloppy lo- steak, you know, like all the... white couch. <laughs> Here's looks back real nice. <laughs> you know the, the guys at uni who were like, just you see like the one of the oldest suits in the world like a neckerchief and they'd be like they'd sit down with you at a pub and be like I do not want to talk to you imagine that happened quite a lot at Edinburgh didn't it yeah probably <laughs> uh-huh. yeah just very like Carly books. Simon yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. just like weird weird guys if I went to uni with you I did not like you <laughs> you know, it, it, just want to name him <laughs> <laughs> just one guy in particular <laughs> but like I can't even remember his name I think I had like one drink with this guy once and I was like this oh, was the worst name I've fucking life when they're looking over at you and looking at themselves in like the glass behind uh, adjusting, the, the, adjusting the neck of you y- yeah very Carly Simon isn't it yeah. are you sure you haven't just listened to the song <laughs> 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 yeah um god someone said that about one of my ex one of my exes that sounds like there's been loads <laughs> my ex the uh-huh. other day not the recent one, um, that apparently whenever they spoke to him at the pub, he would stare at himself in the mirror behind <laughs> while he was talking. <laughs> That's quite damning. <laughs> How tragic is that? Pretty tragic. He used to wear cravats. You know them? You, you're a big fan of him. I mean, clearly it worked. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> clearly cravats work. Why? Well, like, he, the man had a girlfriend. Oh, yeah, but I'm really like... easy. <laughs> Barry on Twitter was right. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we talk any more about the COVID inquiry? Because there was yeah, no... I think I think we should. Yeah, I think um, I basically just wrote. I'm basically really fascinated by the entire. Okay, his setup, Cummings' the setup, right, is that nothing, anything bad that happened was nothing to do with him, and anything that potentially good that would would have happened would have been him, right. I'm just fascinated by his own like dogged belief in his own leadership skills, that he is the only person in the room who knew how to to do anything. And I think that's why he's friends with Boris Johnson or why he was friends with Boris Johnson. Do you think they're friends or do you think he was or kind why of they were? Him? They worked together. No, I think that they were actually friends at one point. And I would I would say that the the two the skills that link them is that they've got no idea what's going on, but they have like a, a belief that they're the only ones who could do it. That's what Helen McNamara said today. Did she? Evidence. She said the point about the Downing Street team was full of like people who were perceived, perceived, perceived themselves as superheroes. They would be the individual to save the day rather than being like a normal person with a normal ego mm. and recognising the limitations of your own skills and recognising the skills of others and working together. It was a lot of people being like, oh, I'm, I will be the one to save this. Like, this is all fucking shit. It's on me. The pressure's on me. Which would be the worst working environment in the world mm. if that was to happen you know Matt Hancock came out of it really badly obviously as well <laughs> I mean, his reputation was is... so good before this <laughs> yeah. but, but the thing that annoyed me about this about, about the Matt Hancock slandering was every single person has had so much to say about him about what an, you know, an idiot he was and he didn't know what was going on and there's that awful cricket thing apparently he did outside <laughs> the... <laughs> that is so funny um, we'll explain that in a second yeah. but, but what's frustrating is not one person decided to oust him. I mean, he wasn't, yeah. you know, he was an elected MP, but he's not... Cummings he's, tried, didn't he? Yeah, but, but do it. If, if, you, yeah, he, if said, he really is that stupid and he really is actually, you know, d- bringing danger to the country, then get rid of him. What was he sitting there for? Yeah, Boris Johnson has to sack him, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Do you think that's because they're worried about, you know, looking weak if they get rid of a cabinet minister in the middle of an emergency? Yeah, well, probably, but I mean, it's probably a bit weaker, isn't it, to have some, some <laughs> sure, guy standing yeah. up going, we are going to do 120,000 tests by next week, and then all these civil servants shitting themselves, going, where do you want us to get these tests from? <laughs> uh-huh. mm. <laughs> Too busy giving Josh a chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Just um, on the Cummings-Johnson dynamic for an, an, another time, um, Rory Stewart told me that <laughs> Cummings had the same meeting with every single one of the leadership candidates uh, for 2019, where he said to them, 
um, you have to unite the party, defeat Jeremy Corbyn and get Brexit done. And he had that with every single one of them, with Rory, with the Saj, with... Jeremy Hunt? Yes, Boris and Gove. No, Gove dropped out. Who was the other one? Fuck Who me. Know? He'd gone by then. That was in the Andrew led to my May have been Gove. Gove. I think it was Gove. I think it was Gove. It was Gove. Yeah, because now the whole thing is that like um, Gove oh. dropped out and then it became Boris's basically. Yeah. And who would have decided that? Because wasn't Dominic Cummings in Gove's office? No, not at that point. No, but at one point. Yeah, yeah, early days. That's how he got brought into government. Early advisor. days, he got, oh, um, yeah. education Could... advisor. Yeah. So he had that meeting with all of them. I am of the view that whichever whichever one of them won, he would have got into got into Downing Street with them in 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 some way and worked with them in some way. And um, it just so happened to be Boris Johnson. I think mm-hmm. he was a vehicle to. Dominic to, Cummings chaos. Exactly. Well, yeah, for him to try and achieve the 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 changes that that he wants to achieve, which, by the way, I think large parts of it do make a lot of sense, having read thousands of words of his blog, <laughs> <laughs> his manifesto, if you will. <laughs> yes, indeed. He um <laughs> he posted this morning on that Substack. He did, and do you know what? I unsubscribed like a couple of weeks ago because I was like, man, Dom hasn't dropped a. <laughs> it's free. Looking value for money for my subscription. There hasn't been a Dom drop for a while. It's not my money; it was the company's money. But I I, I took it off because I was like, we're <laughs> not free getting to into read. this. The current one? Yeah. Um, what he posted this morning. It, it's basically a long a long piece about how Helen McNamara has uh, backed him up completely and uh, evidences everything that he had to say yesterday. And also some more, yeah, some mudslinging on Matt Hancock, <laughs> um, quite naturally. Oh, and also, so there's these really great quotes. So, you know, he's like quibbling over, okay, this quote earlier he did. Cummings, Cummings said, so is the problem A, me calling Hancock a lying cunt killing people, or B, <laughs> Hancock actually being a lying cunt killing people? <laughs> Fact check needed. <laughs> Are they not one and the same? <laughs> Are we not laughing at the fuck pig thing because we think that they're fuck pigs rather than him saying, well, I don't know. I love, the, I love the discourse of like, I cannot believe that he said that. Yeah. Oh it, my God, it, yeah. Oh, really? I, 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 yeah, I have, yeah. I have so, I have so little saying, time right? yeah. for all of these fucking morons who are like, <laughs> um, yes, well, the, 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 the political representatives of, the great, of great Britain and Northern Ireland must maintain the highest standards of decorum and decency at all times. And it's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. The curtain's been lifted and you've seen that they speak like every single other cunt yeah, in this country. And they're also like thick as shit. They like, they like die by like choking themselves and wanking. <laughs> <laughs> Who does? It was a guy in the 80s. <laughs> An MP that did that. Oh, what, Profumo? No. No, no. no. what are you talking about? <laughs> no, there's a guy who died of autoristic asphyxiation in the 80s. An MP. It's not a new thing. Speaking but... of which, when, when am I doing my Edwina Curry fact? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of MPs being sexual in the 80s. You drop your Edwina Curry fact. I, I was joking. I'm going to do autoerotic asphyxiation MP. Oh, I, I got a DM from... Um... <laughs> Speaking of <laughs> that MP. <laughs> Where are you going with that? Um... From a bloke who knew why cricket was such a big thing in Norway. Yeah, he did. Um, he said that there are a lot of naturalisation and first generation Pakistani uh, immigration to Norway in the last 25 years. And as a result of which, um, cricket's massive there. And that their sort of the main cricket spot is in like a sculptural park mm, in, in Norway. Loads of sculpture and a, and a cricket square, yeah. which sounds, sounds great. Um, Stephen Milligan. Found. Let's May hope. Let's hope this is an MP <laughs> because I've just. <laughs> yeah, there he is. He's in the chamber. Found dead in his house in Chiswick in February 1994. Apparently self-strangled by the use of an electrical cord during an act of autoerotic asphyxiation. Fuck pig. <laughs> my friend, that is disrespectful. <laughs> my friend Sorry. slept with an A-lister, who we all know, who um, when they were. Say it. <laughs> um, Say it. You know, you, 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 I know. I know. We can, just... we can bleep it. We'll bleep, we'll bleep it. We'll bleep it. We'll, de- oh, oh, we'll oh, definitely bleep okay. it. <laughs> um, set with him. That's massive. <laughs> and, and like um, the name ever just said is one of the most famous people in the world. Yeah. Uh, you, anyway, you'll, so, know, you'll know them. So when when they were, <laughs> he didn't kiss her the entire time. And That's he had normal, a, isn't it? He had a, <laughs> had a tie around his neck, and he just like from behind and then he made <laughs> made her pull the tie <laughs> so the whole time so that he was on the verge of passing out and he was like I'm going to tap you when I want you to really pull <laughs> <laughs> so that he would pass out and finish <laughs> I thought this was the politics podcast <laughs> <laughs> You've, you've given up the game. That you, you haven't listened to it because 
This is what happens. Um, you'd be disappointed, wouldn't you? In that, well, I think. Well, no, because if you're gonna, if you think, oh my god, I'm gonna fuck so and so, and then, it's the and then that's, just what happened, like... that's what happens. You'd be like, wow. <laughs> it's I mean, be like, maybe you'll fall in love with me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, thank you. How was that for you? Fuck off. Get the fuck out of this hotel room. No, sign the NDA. Fuck off. Um, I said to her, I said, that sounds horrible. Are you okay? And she was like, loved it. <laughs> loved so it. In fairness, it's a great fucking story, right? Yeah. That was good. Mm. Anyway, so Edwina Curry. <laughs> uh, do we have any, any more we'd like to say about the COVID inquiry? Any other actual bits of analysis? Takeaways? I did say. quite I did like um, there was one journalist who was like when the Boris Johnson revelations first started coming out yesterday morning about him being a you know a, a trolley and a fuck pig and all of that it was like extraordinary it seems like he had no idea what he was doing <laughs> <laughs> like, where, where were you <laughs> yeah yeah um, what would we say I just the final quote which I think is quite important um the Prime Minister's top advisor was asked about how much Number 10 considered ethnic minority groups, domestic abuse victims and others in the run-up to imposing a national lockdown and coming certain response. I would say that the entire question was almost entirely appalling and neglected by the entire planning system. He added the Cabinet Office was essentially trying to block us from creating a shielding plan. Um, pretty rough, that, isn't it? Yeah. Lee came, the, Lee came with the point. He said there's a complete lack of diversity of experience mm. in... Um, within the people in charge. And he made the point about why the government was trying to block a uh, Marcus Rashford's free school meals thing. And they did like a straw poll in the people in the meeting room. Had anyone been on free school meals and not no one had. Mm. And he said that was like to their detriment through the planning of there was there was no people with lived experience of poverty or maybe not a diverse enough ethnically um, make up of people to try and handle this situation reflecting everyone's experience. Cummings said something similar about there not being any women in the room. He was like, the women were always on Zoom calls outside of the room. And it was just men who were who were in, you know, on Whitehall discussing all of it. Mm. And he was like, that was to the detriment of a lot of the policies. Because apparently the big one that they missed at the beginning was uh, separate households, you know, if you've got mm. divorced parents or whatever. Oh. And that didn't get looked at for weeks. And then it was <coughs> it was a woman who finally brought it up being like, Hi, sorry, <laughs> have you thought about this? And like, you know, they're all like, oh, God, <laughs> you're right. It is, no. mad, yeah. it is mad how much of it seems to be like, oh, shit, someone's not thought of this. Fuck, mm -hmm. we need to do something about it right now. It's like it's so mm -hmm. retrospective and shit, isn't it? Extremely. It just seems as well, though, but with, even like with Lee Kane yesterday when he was talking about, oh, well, I was behind the Marcus Rashford free school meals campaigns, brilliant campaigner. And I said we should have it, whatever. It's like, are you saying this? Were you actually forced mm. right with this at the time? Or are you just saying this so that it now gets, you know, Put into the history. Yeah. yeah. So it's in it's in your fabric now. This is your legacy. That you're the you're the guy who tried to give the country free school meals and it was evil Dominic or Rishi who didn't want you to have them. Hmm. Who was he up against at the time? Was it was it Boris? Rashford. Who? Yeah. Was that was that kind of like who they juxtaposed the the, the two the two in conflict with each other? Or maybe a Rishi thing because the money? Yeah. I think it was all um, it was all the Conservative MPs who voted against it, wasn't it? Everyone got very upset with them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Gary Sandbrook eats big dinners. <laughs> probably one of the best things. Textbook. Yeah, yeah, love that. Love that. Um, should we move on? Yeah. And that is why, while I understand calls for a ceasefire at this stage, I do not believe that it is the correct position now, for two reasons. <laughs> One, because a ceasefire always freezes any conflict in the state where it currently lies. And as we speak, that would leave Hamas with the infrastructure and the capability to carry out the sort of attack we saw on October the 7th. Attacks that are still ongoing. Hostages who should be released still held. Hamas would be emboldened and start preparing for future violence immediately. Ed, another speech uh, yesterday, which 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 you you had, you had the pleasure of of catching. Um, 
Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer. Trying to, trying to face down the rebellion that's happening inside the Labour Party as, as relates to the situation in Gaza right now. Um, what did you make of Keir Starmer's speech? I thought it was, he's just doubling down. He's standing down the potential rebels. I suppose he's, it's quite an interesting speech because he kind of has, this is kind of him setting out what, would, what will be Britain's foreign policy come next November. See, so I think you have to keep that in mind. He's got to not piss off the Israelis, the Americans, etc. Um, yeah, it's kind of a bit it's just difficult, isn't it, for him? Because he's got he's got there's so much feeling about it. You have opposition at every level outside the outside, outside the literal the hall where he gave it. Right, the protest, oh, yeah, protesters protests. out at the back door waiting for him. Yeah. Um, so there's, so the potential rebellion on the front bench within the back bench within. Labour councillor is resigning. Um, the, within the Labour Party at large, there's members opposing this. And yeah, what what is it? What did you make of it, Josh? Um, kind of on a personal level, I, I kind of agree with it. I think it's a relatively sensible position. I think it walks a careful line where he's saying, look, you know, humanitarian aid should come in. But at the same time, um, I think he kind of maybe correctly realises that like a ceasefire doesn't really solve anything, given that it would probably be a fairly unilateral mm. ceasefire. Um, I don't think anybody, I think, you know, Hamas, there's a guy on um, some Arabic TV station clips on Twitter where he was basically saying they wouldn't respect the ceasefire. They would just try and do October 7th, October 8th, October, whatever, until it, until Israel was destroyed. Um, so I think, he, yeah, like you said, he's he's got to walk this line on it. Uh, I think maybe pressure will grow in the party for him to, to him to change his tack. But I think he's probably betting on the fact that in a couple of weeks, this issue will probably lose a bit of saliency to the average British voter. And people will go back to talking about the economy or house prices or anything else. Um, so I imagine he's thinking he can just kind of ride it out. How much do you think of what's going on in the Labour Party right now is Keir Starmer absolutely petrified of being accused of anti-Semitism, either personally or with anti-Semitism being endemic in the Labour Party, and him having to adopt... Well, actually, I don't know, I don't know about his personal politics on this issue, issue, so I can't speak to them. But let's say, for the sake of argument, the politics more broadly of the Labour Party, which you would describe as sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, and broadly, certainly historically, I mean, last Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, right? Um, certainly not kind of an advocate for Israel, or the way that Israel is currently behaving in Gaza... How much of this do you think is Keir being absolutely terrified of that sort of anti-Semitism coming back, narrative coming back? Do you think he's being sort of calculated in the way he deals with this? What's your, what's your view of his, his approach to the crisis so far? Yeah, so I think basically everything he's done since he got elected as Labour leader is to show that he's different from Jeremy Corbyn, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything, you know, clean house of people, prescribed a bunch of organisations, you know, made it very, very clear that if you're even a whiff of anti-Semitism, you're gone, you're boom, you're out of the party. Uh, I think it's much more about differentiating himself from Jeremy Corbyn uh, than it is about, you know, his personal politics on it. I mean, having said that, he's got a Jewish wife who's got family in Israel. I'm sure there's a level of personal sympathy there. But I think it's far more about showing, hey, look, I'm not that guy. Um, and I think to your average British voter who may be, you know, anti-Semitism is definitely not on the top. 10 list of you know issues that they give a shit about i think it's much more about showing that he's not jeremy corbyn and he doesn't kind of indulge what he would describe as kind of like more fringy uh mm. foreign policy ideas i guess there's also this this question of he's trying to he's trying to win a general election right and he is i think quite rightly and you could probably say quite cynically also made the calculation that those kind of um left the more sort of left wing progressive types who will be upset by his his stance on this issue there's nowhere else for them to go right mm -hmm. when it comes to the next general election they they're not going to vote for the conservative they will never vote for the conservative party possibly they might vote green but it's not going to be enough to to deny labor mp's seats possibly maybe in uh, i think bristol west is one um may, maybe in brighton they won't be able to sort of you know contest where caroline lucas is standing down so you go well Let's just deny the sort of the press, the Tories, the easy victory of saying... Like message discipline, right? Yeah. And I think you've seen it in America as well, where a load of progressives um, have said that they wouldn't vote for Biden anymore. They think this is like a line in the sand issue. 
Um, and then you look at, you know, who the likely nominee is going to be, Donald Trump. And he said, you know, day one, Muslim bans back in. So it's just like, well, you know, if you care about the Palestinian cause, that's not the answer. You know, you're not going to do that. Um, so I think if you're like the sort of centrist Biden Starmer figure, you you feel pretty comfortable about. Who else, who else would they go to? Like fucking Cornell West. Like. Who's progressives in the US. Yeah. Well, they would like have to. He would have to win a primary. Yeah, or do their own thing, write in candidates. I think it's more that they wouldn't turn out in like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and places where where, hurt them, where yeah. Biden needs to win. Um, but they all live in New York anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're all voting Democrat out there, and like, d- d- I mean, it's just such. You watch some of these progressives, right? Or you, uh, we we all did a year abroad, didn't we? In the states, didn't you do one as well? I, I lived in America. It's very okay. very different. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so when you're in when you're at university there, you are around some of the most insufferable people you'll ever meet in your life. Yeah, right? insane, absolutely are, insane. Yes, and they are they aren't even progressive. They are like so far on the other side of it that I'm not even. They don't quite understand the issue, but they've got a very strong view on it, right? <laughs> but they'll be like, and that's why I'm voting Democrat. And I'm like, but do, that's not there. That's that's <laughs> that's, not that's the basically like the British con- the Conservative Party mm. here. You mm. know, it, it's it's got nothing. You're talking about. Um, I don't know, Lebanon and how upset you are about it. I'm like, these guys are bombing it. <laughs> like, you know. I had an unbelievable conversation in America where these two girls were like moaning about Trump. <laughs> As in like, look, moaning sounds like I'm diminishing it. They were like upset something Trump had done. And they, and they were like, <laughs> and, but, no, but, but, but they were, but they were in sit, but they were, oh, what, they were be, they were being performatively polite yeah. about calling them the president or being like Mr. Uh, president sir but, but they were they being, they're being, they're being, like respect the office not the man yeah, yeah. <laughs> they kept saying that and there, there was a big um, there was a big thing after he got elected where people wouldn't say his name there were a lot of like those kind of people who mm-hmm. were like the man who occupies the Oval Office uh-huh. I will not speak his name Trump yeah Trump <laughs> they kind of very much um, as they always do made it about Harry Potter and they yeah. made it into a he who cannot be named kind of kind of deal yeah there was also a guy who a Republican guy I knew who it was also the day after um, the election in all the classes I was in. So I was in North Carolina, just for context for the audience who don't know that. Um, there was a, there was before each class, professors were offering people the chance to like just like talk about how people were feeling. They did that to me too. <laughs> it was I was sitting like. Like, I was really in maths quite... 101 and oh. they were like okay we're, we're just going to start with like how you know how are you okay oh. you know, that was really bad that Holly Willoughby like... vibes yeah. yeah yes Yeah. were we working to... no I think you had gone to the states by that point mm. yeah because in our yeah, in our in, in, New York. A, yeah, in our newsroom it was like there was a meeting and it was like look I know everyone's probably feeling pretty down right now <laughs> about what <laughs> I mean there was so like, I, I literally I couldn't give a fuck <laughs> there were, I yeah. live in London <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sorry, sorry guys I, well I think they also um, at the time the company we worked for was split between New York and London and they did have to have a chat with some of the British employees about hmm. not doing 9-11 jokes on Slack <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was <laughs> the weird place. Do it on your personal phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take, take <laughs> it off the work. There was like a mass cry in front of one of the university buildings mm. as well. Were you there? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, guess game. He organised it. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't know if this will make the edit, but there was um, <laughs> Josh and I and some of our colleagues had a WhatsApp WhatsApp group where one Christmas we decided it would be funny to do like a series of memes using like um, turning like ISIS guys into like Christmas based memes so it'd be like <laughs> so it'd be like when the guy doing the, the yeah, one Uma you know one Uma you know and they put one finger up yeah. it's like one you know one total sovereign um, yeah exactly and we'd be like when mum asks who wants more turkey and it's like the lads <laughs> <laughs> doing this <laughs> yeah anyway <laughs> Sean Goodbye, made some, I don't know if this will make the edit either but Sean made some great content earlier so do you know the Saddam Hussein bunker <laughs> yes <laughs> You know the diagram that like the Daily Mail did or whatever yeah. to show where Saddam Hussein lied, <laughs> where he was lying down. We'll put them in visually if this makes it in. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> Sean put, photoshopped that diagram onto like various other things like the Pope Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> See if you could fit. Yeah, where, where you can find Saddam Curious, Hussein. Curious, it fits the exact dimensions of Saddam Hussein. <laughs> <laughs> what conspiracy? Just asking questions. <laughs> Um, one of the other things from Starmer's speech, he uh, he referenced the two-state solution, and I would I wondered what the panel's view 
of the two-state solution is and whether it is actually viable given events of the last couple of weeks because well first of all i think the, the sort of the cause of palestinian statehood is has been set back somewhat by recent events um but it also appears to me that the sort of the only two i think the only two options left appear to be either like some form of greater israel i.e the sort of the far-right zionist project of expelling those people from gaza establishing the settlements there or oslo i don't i don't really see i don't see this I'm not sure that what he's talking about here is now a possibility. And I don't know if you guys see it the same way. He talked about settlements. He talked about settlements in Israel. Yeah. Um, Go on. I do, I, well, no, no. I don't have anything to add. I, ju I just think that in, in terms of the, the speech, I just felt the speech lacked clarity and lacked any vision or idea or ideas. I mean, afterwards, when journalists were asking questions like, okay, so you're in charge right now. What do you do? And he mm -hmm. was like, well, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> and, you know, obviously we've got to focus on the humanitarian aid, but I'm not in charge and it's not it's not for me to decide. And it's like, you know, if you are going to do this huge speech, you're going to, you know, organise, th th this is the moment to really set your stall out, be a bit, I don't know, Churchill about it. If You know, they will, they will love being Churchill, don't they? <laughs> they will love pegging that. Um, why organise a huge speech if you've not got any actual policy or ideas to me it just seemed like he was trying to wash his or launder his reputation a little bit and try to uh, make himself you know appear statesmanlike without actually doing anything and now you think well okay if you were in government would he be doing anything differently to how the conservatives are acting probably not and i think the speech he was trying to set himself as the you know uh, trying to put a bit of i don't know a wedge of difference between them and actually i think he proved that they are exactly the same mm. Was that boring? Sorry. No, 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 no. not at all. I'm just, I was listening. Good points. You. No, I, I, I think you're right, but I mean, you know, I think him and Rishi didn't they say that they wouldn't <coughs> go after each other on foreign policy? I think yeah. his big thing has been like the Tories have fucked up this country, right? They have specifically fucked up this country. I think 99% of the criticism of the Tory Party for the last 13 years has been on their domestic policy. I haven't really seen. I mean, obviously, other than Brexit, um, <laughs> it's mostly been about how they've fucked up within these within mm. these shores um so yeah i mean i, I think they probably no, I don't the want same. him to go for sunak i don't want him to criticize the way that sunak is approaching the the, the conflict it's mm. just it but you kind of want to you, you want to offer some difference right you want to set out a stall i and, don't you know, uh, yeah. show what you are offering and the the, the 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 conflict that he finds himself that's a terrible word to use there um the predicament that he's in at the moment is that most of his party or a lot of his party are resigning because they don't like what he is offering mm. He's not, he's not changed that. He's not done anything to change any minds there, right? You've still got backbenchers who are not pleased with what the Labour Party are offering. And then his point, is his point not, well, tough tits. Like, yeah. This is what, this but he didn't what, say that. No, 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 no. But as in he's saying, he's, he's, not, he's not bending to he's those people's without wills. saying it. And that's, and that's, no, no, but say it. If you think it, say it. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. You know? Well, well I think it's, you know, to go on to the, the two-state thing, I think that's the easy thing to to make it about the future, right? To make it about like, you know, we need to, everybody needs to forget about what's happening right now and invest in the, the two state solution, which is just a word that's just, you know, everybody chucks it out. No one actually thinks about what it, what it means. Um, yeah. I think to put across what I believe like the Israelis would say in this situation is that they don't feel like they've got like a viable partner for a two state solution. Um, on the one hand, you've got, you know, people that have, murdered uh, 1,400 people in cold blood, um, you know, in a sort of horrendous terror attack. And on the other side, you've got Mahmoud Abbas of the PA who like can't really, really run things super well. He's like really old, quite corrupt. Like the PA is kind of, you know, not serving anybody particularly well. Um, I think the, the problem is, is that right now, because of what happened on October 7th, there is nothing else the Israeli public are thinking about other than the war, uh, and secondarily getting rid of, of Netanyahu. Um, I think, you know, if you're not Jewish or you're not Israeli, you, it's kind of hard to, to think about how like existential it feels to be in Israel. Um, you constantly feel that you are under attack from all sides and that the world won't stand with you if, if it all goes tits up. Um, so, you know, I, I asked an Israeli journalist the other day, like, you know, does anybody care? about these massive protests in London. And the answer is like, no, right? They, they assumed the world wasn't with them. It looks like the world's not with them. They, they proceed accordingly. Uh, and I think this, the attacks on October 7th had this kind of really radicalizing effect on like 
ordinary Israeli people that maybe headed Netanyahu, maybe wanted to do a two-state solution. Uh, when you've seen that amount of like chaos and bloodshed, you don't want to, you're not in a negotiating headspace. Uh, I interviewed an Israeli pilot a few weeks ago who hated Netanyahu, like fucking hated him, like hated Ben Gvir, hated Smotrich, said he refused to fly for the Israeli Air Force as long as, um, as long as they were in power, like, you know, like much more aggressive condemnation of Israel than anybody else was doing, uh, you know, until, until recently. And then I spoke to him again recently and he's like, fuck that. I'm, I'm on board. I'm, I'm flying every day for them. Um, right now I hate, I hate them all, but I, I this is, there's a bigger, there's a bigger thing here. Uh, what is that bigger thing? Is it revenge? Uh, I don't think it's revenge the way that he described it to me. Um, is that the only language that people in the Middle East that want to kill you speak, the only language they speak is violence. And if you let people get away with stuff, then you will just be pushed around and Hezbollah will invade and Iran will invade and Yemen will invade and everything will go to shit and there'll be, you know, no more Israel. So it's like, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and defend every action of the IDF. I disagree with a lot of what they do and, and I think it's, you know, sometimes quite hard to defend them. But if you look at the perspective of, what their choices are it's like an impossible it's an impossible situation so i think the, the perspective you've given there about particularly the history of israel and israel as a place where jews would defend themselves is is fundamentally important one that's often overlooked and and i think particularly actually aspects of kind of progressives who criticize israel's actions have a very very short memory in terms of why israel was created and obviously the holocaust and then the immediate history of every single one of its Arab neighbors attacking it relentlessly um, and then having to defend themselves for their right to exist. Um, obviously, and then at the expense of the Palestinians and, and, and the Nakba, right? But you say, you say, okay, yeah, I accept all of that history. I accept that this feels existential for the Israeli people. But when half of the people that have been killed so far are women and children you know those aren't egyptian then those aren't egyptian tanks you know in the sinai those mm -hmm. aren't hezbollah it's not a conflict in the golan heights you know mm -hmm. it's it's a refugee camp yeah. that's, that's being for example yesterday right it's being yeah. bombed and you find i find myself actually in the uncomfortable position of being like you know i 100 percent support israel's right to exist i'm it's, it's like one of the one of, i think sort of an unorthodox thing I view I have for the sort of general politics I have, to be honest with you. Um, for, sort of, for It's certainly compared to a lot of other people anyway. And yet, I cannot in any way, shape or form justify the military action that they've been taking in recent weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, it kind of gets overlooked, but I think, you know, you every, every, every life that's lost in this conflict is awful and horrible. And like, I've watched stuff from Gaza that makes me feel really uncomfortable. I've watched stuff from Israel that makes me absolutely distraught. Like every single life that's lost is awful. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, try and defend every, every civilian death because you can't, you just can't defend that, right? But I think the, the, the point is, is that when you're fighting an enemy that doesn't particularly have any sort of regard for like the rules of warfare or, you know, life in general, um, the argument from the Israelis um, would be that you are dealing with people that cannot take any other, you know, will not listen to any other action other than violence. And, you know, if you want to believe what the Israeli Defense Force said about the refugee camp, um, and you look at the videos and see that there was, you know, quite a lot of sinkholes, the argument was that there was a Hamas terror tunnels uh, underneath and that they were using those to, to fire rockets. Um, but you know, I it, it's a hard. It's you know, it's still it's, it's hard. It's tough. It's like it's it's war, right? It's it's mm -hmm. not pleasant. It's not nice. It's not good for anybody. Um, and I dare say there are huge parts of the Israeli population that disagree with it. I mean, they've made themselves clear. There's already protests in Israel about it. Um, that was the ironic thing, right? Some, quite a lot of the hostages from like the Gaza envelope were yeah. some of the most pro-Palestinian Israelis. Yeah, going and you know I've. Um, as you as you well know, sort of politically, I'm I'm quite comfortable in a way that a lot of people aren't with sort of political violence and violence for political ends, um, and I'm quite accepting of you know um, war for a just cause or you know armed struggle to to secure liberation. 
Um, it, you know, and that extends to the Palestinians as it does to other movements that have existed in the past. There has to be this question of proportionality, doesn't there? There, ha there has to be this question, like the example I've, I've, I've referenced before, I think I mentioned it on LBC, was like the Harrods bombing, right? Um, by by Irish, Repu Irish Republicans. And they put the bomb at the door of Harrods outside and it kills four people. If the bomb is put inside Harrods, hundreds of people die. The nature of terrorism has changed. Terrorism now is much more nihilistic. And whereas before it was the limited use of extreme violence to achieve mm. political ends, now it is much more total. So, for example, Al-Qaeda fly jumbo jets into the World Trade Center and kill 3,000 people. Hamas paraglide into a fucking music festival and just shoot up the, the port of loose. And obviously the scale is different, but you have to remember the population of Israel is dramatically smaller and the scale of the people that were killed on October 7th is colossal. And that the nature of terrorism is, change, is changing. And instead of being, you know, the limited use of extreme violence for political ends, it is instead um, sort of clash of civilizations, nihilistic, total destruction. And so, for example, with Hamas, it's the stated aim, which they've never renounced, as far as I'm aware, of the eradication of the Jews in, in, in Palestine, right? It's not, we will conduct a limited bombing campaign and to, bring, <laughs> to, to bring BB to the table. It's, we will annihilate you. And that's, 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 a, that's a marked departure from the way violence was used politically previously. What do you mean there's no end goal? Well, no, there is an end goal, but it's like, like yeah. it's total. Mm. It's not like a negotiated settlement. Right. It's an end goal that elicits an equally harsh response, right? Mm. It's, you know, you can't, if someone says to you, we want to drive all the Jews out of Israel, like, what, what's the answer there? Um, you know, and I think there's this feeling among a lot of Jews, especially people I know, is that, you know, Israel was always viewed as the one place where you'd be safe to be a Jew. Um, and that's kind of really been shattered. Um, you know, my holiday to Dagestan has now been cancelled because of what's happened the other day. Um, I can't go there anymore. Um, but there was this uh, tweet. You were really looking forward to that. I know, I know. I've been saving up for, for months. But um, there's, this, there's, this, there's this tweet that I saw the other day that was basically like, for people who don't want the Jews to be in Israel, they have a really funny way of making us feel welcome everywhere else in the world. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of anxiety in the Jewish community. Some of it justified, some of it not. Um, but yeah, I, I think Israel was always held up as being this safe place and that's, uh, and that's changed. Does that logic also extend to the Palestinians? Well, the people that live in Gaza who are currently, um, well, being, being bombed out of existence. Um, does the same logic extend to them that this is, it's a tiny strip of land. It's mm -hmm. virtually the only, only place left on earth. You know, uh, the ones that are still there because uh, Palestinians compose the largest, the la ethnically compose the largest amount of refugees globally compared to any other, any other nation. That that was the only place they have left and now they are under attack there. Sort of, where do they turn? Where do, what, what do they do now? Yeah, I mean, look, if not necessarily I agree with it, but if you're particularly hard-nosed, you would say that um, Jordan is a Palestinian state. It was founded... Um, from the British Mandate of Palestine. It's largely comprised of people that are ethnically Palestinian. Um, I'm not saying that all, all the Palestinians that are where they are now should go to Jordan. Um, but what I would say also is that even the most extreme um, Israeli politicians, even like your Ben Gvirs and your Smotriches, they have never said, as far as I'm aware, I could be wrong on this, they've never said we would like to destroy all of them and drive them into the sea. They've never said that. What they've said is, you know, they'll build settlements on land that they consider historically theirs. They will put like security walls in Gaza. They've said a whole variety of things that are unfair to Palestinians and people don't agree with. But I don't think you've seen the same kind of language. Um, and I think the argument is, is that, you know, if there was a stable Palestinian state alongside a Jewish state, that would be the best outcome for everybody. That's what we all want, right? That's what I want. That's what everything else, you know, my dad grew up uh, in Israel and he grew up, you, you know, he used to be able to go to Jericho, uh, which is in the West Bank. He used to be able to go there all the time. After the first Intifada, you know, where they were killing Jews that accidentally ended up there, you can't go there anymore. And so it just feels for the last like decades, they've been drifting further and further and further and further away um, from any kind of, you know, possible negotiated settlement. Uh, but to your point about like, you know, where the Palestinians should be and where they should go, I don't think they should go anywhere. I think they have, you know, as much right to live in, in the places they've always lived as, as Israelis do. Um, 
And I, yeah, I think they've got as much right to live in security and peace as, as anyone else. You look like you're going to say something. Well, no, I think that then that, that actually corrects it. Because, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't. Your argument about Jordan, I mean, where do they go now? That's the. Who? The, well, the Palestinians, where do they go now if they're in Gaza? They can't. I don't, I don't want to go anywhere. Go to I, I, yeah, that's what I was going to say, because yeah. you answered it then. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for pointing that towards me. I think the problem the, the problem with um, you know the smart riches and the Ben Gaviers is they they have said you know some pretty atrocious things in the past. Not one of them's definitely I can't remember which one it is because they I don't want to say birds of a feather, but they are similar to each other. One of them's one of them's definitely said death to, death to the Arabs um, at least once. You know they are not they're not nice guys, um, and that's kind of my concern really is that there is now this far right. Uh, Zionist element. It's it's not even. Uh, it's really interesting looking at the language of like um, Moshi Dayan, and you know who previously you would have said was like a pretty hardcore kind of guy. Um, early days of the state of Israel and the shift of the language from people like him, where he would sort of speak at speak at funerals. Zizek wrote about this, I think, in the New Statesman. I can't remember the exact quote, so I just point people to go and read what he said in that. Um, and the sort of conciliatory language that that he uh, that he evoked in that that sort of you know. The deaths of Arabs and the deaths of Jews were regrettable, but you know there was a there, there was sort of work towards a solution, towards the now far more kind of total language of the, those far right characters mm. and the extreme wings of that Zionist ideology that you know of, of a greater Israel, of a expulsion of Palestinians from Gaza um, and the West Bank. And the thing that concerns me particularly is the the growth of that politics in Israel, uh, particularly among the younger generation, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're seeing as a uh, demographic change, it's something that's not happening here in Britain, but it's very definitely happening in Israel and in other parts of Europe, is that actually young people are adopting this extreme, extreme politics, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that you assume those younger people are going to become, they will eventually become a majority of the electorate, at which point, you know, you sort of got this baked in, unless things change, and obviously they can do, but you then have this baked in extremist position into Israeli electoral politics. And the consequences of that could be obviously be very severe. Yeah, I, I, I look, I think that's a complicated uh, demographic reality, right? Like the two fastest growing groups in Israel are Arab Israelis and very, very ultra Orthodox Jews. Um, and that, you know, in 20 years time is going to present, well, it's kind of already presenting itself now, but like, it's going to present a very interesting and probably quite bad situation um, where you have the two biggest groups that are kind of slightly opposed to each other, to put it to put it quite lightly. Um, but yeah, I think this this is the this is the thing, right? Is that like Israel pr pr yeah, previous to October seventh? Every time Israel had been talked about this year, it was because of the sort of horrible right wing lean in its government. I think if anything comes out of this. Um, for the Israeli people, uh, it will be uh, perhaps a awareness that you cannot have these fucking clowns anywhere near government anymore. I think it's already happening. Like mm. you see, you know, Netanyahu's last grants, last chance to get power was off the back of these idiots, and he's now come in and basically proved that he's not up to the job, and that you know for the last six months to a year, Israel Israeli society has been divided over this completely bullshit thing. And the judicial reforms. The judicial reforms, you know. Um, but I think what's going to come out of it is that they need to return to adults again. Um, and they need to have serious politicians that are not nut jobs and are not, you know, you know, embarrassments, right? But we'll see. And just like that, by the magic of editing, Ed Campbell has become Sean Hickey as I live and breathe. Clap him into the pavilion, lads. <laughs> clap myself. Here he is. How are you, Sean? Great job vision mixing the last hour and Thank ten minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And there There's goes. a lot to do. That's the light, isn't it's it? The light going, yeah. Yeah, you really set the studio up well today. It's good. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. Um, as Ed said, he has um, an interview to prepare for, uh, which is very important, so he's had to go. But we've got Sean here instead for a quick five minutes on the protest at Liverpool Street Station yesterday, Sisters Uncut, and uh, an organisation uh, of Jewish activists whose name surpasses me at this moment in time, unless anyone's got it there. No, but they were the people who were also outside Elbit. Palestine action? But, 
No. Sisters Uncut and um, a group of Jewish activists organised a sit-in at uh, Liverpool Street Station uh, in support of the Palestinian cause. We can probably play a little clip. We'll probably play a little clip, can't we? Sean, you'll be able to drop that in. You'll be able to drop roll that in. Roll the clip. Yeah, roll Sean. the clip. Roll the clip, <laughs> Sean. <laughs> Increasing fervour, increasing clamour from the luxury of our Western Ivory Tower um, for people to sort of, uh, for, for, for people to demand justice. Is that justice. how you're going to set it up? Yeah, that's how is I set that it really up. How you set yeah, it I mean, up? look, it's, it's very easy, isn't it? It is very easy to, to stage a sit in at Liverpool Street Station. And I, don't, I, I don't agree with that, actually. Okay. I'm not saying it's anywhere near comparable. Yeah. Um, but I do, I, I do think that there are a lot of ordinary people and not activists who are attending. Oh some of these marches and I think they are they are doing it in a oh God, it's going to sound trivial if I say it but I mean I think you know people are going with the knowledge that they might lose their jobs either side of it either side of the argument anyone who's speaking you know potentially speaking out either side could lose their jobs at the moment and I think that's quite um, a big thing to do it's not it's not just fucking, a we get fucking paid to sit here and take a view on it which is kind of an irony isn't yeah. it yeah I mean I guess it is easy yes this is an ivory this is an ironic ivory tower this is an ivory tower ivory basement <laughs> yeah, so we are sub. We are underground. Um, look, this is this is. I'm I'm being obviously quite glib when I talk about this. Um, so forgive me, but for, okay. First things first. These are not hate marches, as yeah. Suella Braverman described the protest at the weekend. And I saw also Brandon Lewis tweet the Liverpool Street one, being like, "So sad, can't believe my country or something." And has they were like, chanting mm. for a ceasefire. Yeah, which is you know is not great. I think it's a complete, I think it's a willful misrepresentation of a lot of the people that are there who broadly speaking, you know, yes, at these marches, there have been, you know, his but here people, there have been people well, calling no, that's for really jihad. Well, that's actually really important, I think, because there are people calling for jihad and there are people who are saying, you know, there was that sign about Hamas over the weekend. I mean, those sort of people, what I don't understand is, sorry, to go off. <laughs> no, but no. What I don't understand is why the organisers don't call it out. Why don't the organisers say there was a march adjacent to the, the pro-Palestine march. The, they were holding pro-Hamas signs. They were shouting jihad in the, you know, in the arrestable sense, mm. right? In the hateful sense. Mm. We do not align with their values. Why don't they call it out? It would be so much easier than go through the rigmarole of like pretending or deflecting and acting like it's not there. And you're basically then just, you know, homogenizing both of the groups because there are there are earnest people on that march, right? You've got, you know, you've got teachers, nurses, doctors who are marching on that because they genuinely can't bear the thought of babies being killed in Gaza, right? You know, they don't like the idea of 3,000 children being killed. But on the flip side of that, you've got, you've got, you know, some, like, maybe 10 pro-Hamas guys. Condemn them. Mm -hmm. You know, let, let, let teachers go on their nice little march. Mm -hmm. and tell them to maybe fuck off. Maybe that's the difficulty as well of, like, say, the ones on Saturday, right, where it's, like, between three and 500,000 people showing up. That's not one group that's arranged for all those people to get there. Mm. And you then have the choice as someone who thought they were arranging a, a march of 5,000 people putting your neck out and saying, I don't condemn these, these guys showing pro Hamas signs. You then have the opportunity to then go on TV, radio, wherever it might be, to be condemning people who you, who you ne were never associated with in the first place. So you're putting yourself in a very difficult situation to condemn people. Whilst you probably do so in your private life, to then have to say, two, three weeks down the line, go on Piers Morgan and then have to have a debate with him on the merits of Palestine action when you were just, you know, like it, it, it the, the way the boulder rolls is just going to end up screwing you at the end. You know, it's is never it? going to be a positive outcome for you if you were to come out and say, I, although you should, mm -hmm. I agree with you, you should come out and condemn Hamas if you're at one of these marches. No, but if you organise them, if you, yeah, yeah, if you organise the march. But what I said, with it being between three and five hundred thousand people there, it's not one group that's 
arranging for all those people to be there. So if you are the there brave is, soul... There is an original group who is the organiser of the leaflets that went out and of the posters that were distributed over no, social No, but then media. more groups will get involved in it as well. So like it's not just share, one Palestine please group. Please share. You, pro Hamas, you're not welcome at yeah. this march. Yeah, yeah, share yeah. that, you know? Mm-hmm. Because it, yeah. I think it just, I just think it dilutes the whole... Well, I, it, it makes a mockery of the entire march if you've got someone up there with a, a pro Hamas sign, and you know that that's going to be the you know the Daily Mail front page, and quite right it should be because that is outrageous that someone is doing that in the capital city, and they're not being arrested for it. So condemn it, and then you can go on your march and mm-hmm. you can carry on with what you're looking for. You know. Yeah. Do you want to come in before I say something, Josh? No, I mean, yeah, I, I obviously agree with Ava. I would say perhaps the reason why. People don't want to come out um, and say that, you know, they condemn it or whatever is because I think, you know, big march, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, they don't know who these people are, right? They don't know who, what, how they signed up, what they got involved with. You know, if you saw one of the flyers that came from an original group that condemns it, you know, I don't know. It feels like it's people don't want to say it because it'll fracture the movement and it'll Mm. reduce the the whole solidarity Mm -hmm. in the face of it. This is the unfortunate because the opponents of um, sort of Palestinian liberation and the Palestinian struggle, these moronic politicians who are describing these marches as hate marches and, um, you know, so, so sad to see this protest taking place because they are willfully misrepresenting the entire thing deliberately. It puts you in a unenviable, unenviable position of basically having to achieve ideological purity for a, a, an amorphous political political movement, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like any political movement, is splintered, contains factions, contains freaks, you know, people that you would normally, you wouldn't have to disavow yourself from because it would go without saying mm. that the people being like, yeah, the October 7th attack was justified. You, everyone would be like, well, obviously that person's a fucking nutter. Like that, that, that person, surely, of the, let, for the sake of argument, let's say it was half a million people who marched on Saturday. Those half a million people do not think that the that the massacre and you know let's call it what it was a pogrom, mm. they do not support that right. They they clearly do not support that. There there aren't half a million people that think that. Unfortunately, there is also, and it needs stating, people who view Hamas as the sort of um, the militant wing of Palestinian liberation and that their actions are justified. Mm. Now, again, as I've said previously. I think I, I'm actually generally broadly okay with limited limited and proportional use of violence to achieve political ends. I am okay with that. But to sort of make that argument in light of what happened, I think is... Um, silly. Yeah, silly, distasteful, ugly, call it what you like. Yeah. Yeah. I just think, yeah. I mean, like, if, if you're going to have a movement that is anti-racist, right, then mm-hmm. you can't have this sort of passive sympathy with it so that when if you are you know look i went i went to the marches i went to the marches but equally if you see you know the star of david being painted onto a wall in paris that's your time to go that's disgusting Mm. that is that is not what i i i believe in that is not why i am fighting for palestine to you know a ceasefire or whatever that's not why i'm arguing for it you should call it out. The anti anti racism is not a movement unless it's all encompassing, right? Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, well, I, the only thing I will say is that you know, I while I wouldn't categorize them as as hate marches, I do think in some contexts there is like an intimidatory factor to them. Um, I think you know maybe it's changed in the last few weeks, but I think the march that took place at the Israeli embassy on October on the night of October 7th or October 8th when it were when it, immediately after the attacks before Israel started retaliating where you know it was very much a sort of celebratory uh mood i would say that you know had elements of hate to it uh do i think that you know 100,000 people walking down whitehall uh with palestine flags are all hateful people no obviously not but i think you know there was also rumors of a march that was going to happen in golders green last weekend you know in a specifically jewish area and so I think, you know, I support people's rights process. I think, you know, it's an absolutely perfect, you know, perfectly valid cause to 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 march for. And I think Ava's right in that a lot of people are just doing this from a sort of an earnest humanitarian point of view. Um, but I think it's important to realize um, as Jews in this country, we are an incredibly small minority. You know, the amount of people, if it was 300,000, if it was 500,000 people, that's probably double or triple the amount of Jews in, in this entire country. Mm. Um, and so I think as a as a population, we often feel like we're vastly outnumbered. And I think the thing that always gets me is that 
it always seems to be Israel that draws the biggest crowds, the biggest outrage. All roads lead to Israel, yeah. All roads lead to Israel. For people, for a certain type of person, the ultimate sin is Israel's existence. You know, like when Assad was, you know, chemical bombing his own people to the order of like hundreds of thousands, you did not have the same level of, you know, outcry. When, you know, there's like an ethnic conflict in Armenia and Azerbaijan, you do not have the same level of outcry. When you have like civil wars in Africa that are especially bloody and like ethnically based, you do not have the same level of, you know, outcry from general, nice, you know, normal nurses and teachers. And I think as Jews, people people feel like, why why are we a special case? Why do why does it Israel that gets the biggest crowds and the biggest and the most vitriol and the most you know fringe elements joining? It, that's the only part that I think um, you know people are complaining about. Do you go? On. Do you think that's anti-Semitism? Do you think alternatively? Do you think alternatively? It's it's so on the nose. It's so on the nose that. A people that were persecuted, killed, exterminated, are then, and I'm sorry, I want to be absolutely clear, I'm not drawing an equivalence between the Holocaust and the treatment of the Palestinian people. What I'm saying is, you know, the effective ghettoization of them in Gaza, hmm. the bombing of them in the way that they are, that people go that people see that and go, you should know better. Oof. No, in a, in, a, in a short sentence, because um, I think conspiracy theories like to... Jews have two roles in conspiracy theories, right? Either we are globally domineering Zionist cabals that like to control everything, or we are like subhuman scum. Um, I think expecting a sort of moral superiority to Jews because we've been killed before is a little bit silly. I think Jews are people just like anyone else, you know, not to quote Shakespeare, but there's a whole thing about that. You should look it up. Um, and I think, you know... You can frame it like that, and I think that's you know your right to do so. But I think I wasn't framing it like that. I was saying that. <laughs> it sounded like you. Were no, right. sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure, but one could frame it like that. Yeah. Uh, one, Ollie. One, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Cancel me. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very, very different, and I, I don't think that um, Jews are like this special group that think you know should know better i think if any country was attacked in the way that israel has been they would react in the same way if for example there had been 20 simultaneous ariana grande manchester arena bombings on the same night i think the hellfire that would rain down from this country would be absolutely insane uh and it's done by france by the way who's just there um and you know you're expected to live with france forever fine anyway um I think israel is a country like any other that acts how any other country would act in this situation Mm. We derailed the point there. There are, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> I was just going to say something. I, I agree with you about that march in Golders Green. If there was going to be a march, that is hateful. Yeah. That is calculated, and that is that is that is being done to mm -hmm. yeah, that's being done to intimidate. Right? That would mm. be like if you. I mean, I used to live in Stoke Newington, and if you were going to do a pro-Palestine march through there on a Saturday morning, when you've got you know, kids walking to the goal. Yes, exactly. And you've got you know, all the Orthodox boys out and about. That's a hateful thing this, to do. This is the massive problem I have with, with all of this, right? Is that like, you know, Josh is not responsible for what's happening. Like the lads in the lads in Golders Green are not responsible for what's happening. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that most sensible people know that. Yeah. But it's it's about whether you vocalize it. This is what I'm arguing about the marches, right? So it doesn't matter if you see you're on the march and you see a sign that says, you know, Hamas was right, and you go, I would never think that. That's disgusting. Okay. Say it, mm. you know, use your words mm. because you're on a march saying something. So call that out as well. Yeah. But I mean, what I would just add is that like, yeah, I think majority of sensible free thinking people know that Jews aren't responsible to that. But I think the people who are the biggest problem, AKA your sort of Dagestani type hate mobs, uh, not that's a problem in this country, but I think for them, there is no distinction, right? To an anti-Semite, they don't care if I voted against Netanyahu in every election. You know, they Hamas didn't give a shit that, you know, the people at the peace protest, you know, some of them used to drive Gazans to the hospital in Israel. They don't care about that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think people that really hate Jews really hate Jews, um, regardless of how connected they are to Israel. Anything to add, Sean? No, nothing. Should we draw, should we draw a line under it there? Yeah. Another line drawn. Another line drawn. Yeah. Sean, uh, Magic Ed. Sean, maybe that's your nickname. Magic, Magic Ed. Ed. <laughs> I don't think we got enough out of Sean. 
Should we just suddenly ask him a just whole slew of questions? Just poke me for a bit. <laughs> Sean, how would you find peace Sean, in the Middle East? <laughs> Sean, Sean, why have you not condemned What's your Hamas's view action? <laughs> this two-state solution. Yeah. Go on. I'm not. I'm give, not. Us your two, give, us your two, give us your view on the two-state. Just a line straight down the middle. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bang on. Bang really? A bridge from Gaza to the other side for a week. <laughs> and then straight down the middle. And yeah. then what? The, the sausage alignment agreement we have to bring in. <laughs> Yeah. Just like the old, just like. Exactly. Uh, just like Northern Ireland. Yeah. We had a really long discussion earlier, Sean and I, about whether <laughs> you have to pay, if you've got a UK bank card, you have to pay extra to get your euros out in the Republic. <laughs> <laughs> really long conversation that we could have resolved just by Googling it, but we still haven't. So nice. if you'd like to tell Sounds us on cool. the Reddit. Yeah, let us know on the <laughs> <Let> Reddit. <us> <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, see you in the Reddit for... Good faith discussion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and always a handful of memes. Until next time, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you then.